Mr. Chang is the co-founder of Christians in the Vaccine, a group that aims to promote vaccine confidence among evangelical Christians. To conduct this outreach, Christians in the Vaccine has partnered with the Ad Council, National Association of Evangelicals, COVID Collaborative, and the Values Partnership. In addition to his faculty appointment at Duke Divinity School, Mr. Chang is a senior fellow at the Fuller Theological Seminary. His ministry experience includes serving as senior pastor of an evangelical covenant church in California and as a campus minister with the InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. He's also done mission work in South Africa and is, found, is the founder of an award-winning nonprofit consulting firm. Mr. Chang earned his bachelor's degree at Harvard University and is a former Rockefeller fellow. Mr. Chang, thank you for being here with us today. Senators, the road to ending the pandemic runs through the evangelical church, especially the white evangelical church. At the national level, white evangelicals comprise the single largest vaccine hesitant demographic in the country, with almost half signaling that they will not get vaccinated. At the state level, if you took a map of the least vaccinated states, it corresponds very tightly to a map of the Bible Belt, with some states not reaching even one third of vaccination rates. And at the global level, American evangelical culture is highly influential in parts of Asia and Africa. We're already exporting our misinformation and fears to the rest of the world, especially via social media. Reaching every demographic in our country matters, but we are not ending the pandemic unless we convince more white evangelicals to get vaccinated. And this is why I, along with Chris Carter, who's here today, founded Christians in the Vaccine. It's a partnership with the Ad Council, COVID Collaborative, the National Association of Evangelicals and Values Partnerships. And we've produced and distributed a range of online video content to equip the evangelical community to address vaccine hesitancy in our own community. Why are white evangelicals so hesitant? Well, vaccine trust is essentially a proxy for institutional trust. Every one of us only takes the vaccine to the extent we trust the FDA, the CDC, pharmaceutical companies, and public health. Unfortunately, the level of distrust among white evangelicals with large institutions is at an all-time high. Now, there's complex and long-standing reasons for this growing distrust. Our own community's vulnerability to misinformation is certainly a big factor. But in the context of the vaccine, this tendency towards distrust has been exacerbated by public health's inattention and overlooking this particular community. While there's been hand-wringing about evangelical attitudes in the mainline media, there has been little targeted outreach from public health. As one state health official admitted to us, she said, we've spent maybe two minutes thinking about white evangelicals. To the extent that the public health has engaged with faith communities, it has overwhelmingly been with minority faith communities where it has succeeded with remarkable effect, driving a 10-point jump in vaccine acceptance among black Protestants in just a few months of outreach. Now, this racial equity emphasis has been absolutely necessary, given historical inequities and current barriers of access. However, this focus has not been matched by attention to the largest and most vaccine-hesitant community. And this inattention is simply counterproductive in a national pandemic where we're all connected. As a person of color, I need public health to focus on white evangelicals because what they decide affects my community. As our work has gained prominence, we did have the opportunity to speak with several key national public health institutions, all of whom showed great interest. However, they had no available pathway to partner with us to expand our efforts. Again, a key reason given was the fact that our focus did not fit the minority-focused communities. Another issue was that the vast majority of federal funding on vaccine outreach simply gets distributed to state public health agencies, meaning there's no efficient pathway for the federal government to partner with us on a coordinated national outreach. But it's not too late. It's not too late to persuade the white evangelical community. Faith-based efforts do work, as demonstrated by the success reaching black Christians. And one very recent study by PRRI showed that 44% of vaccine-hesitant evangelicals say that they would still be influenced by faith-based efforts. The key recipe is a partnership between public health and faith leaders in the evangelical community. 
The message and the voice have to come from the faith leaders themselves because they're the trusted voices. But public health can make a big difference by convening the faith leaders, by providing resources to amplify their voices, and then especially by taking cues from those faith leaders on which public health efforts will work in their communities. The last point about taking cues from faith leaders is critical because there is no one-size-fits-all approach. For instance, what works in the black church, such as having churches host vaccination sites, often does not work in the white evangelical church context. So I respectfully submit the following two requests to this committee for consideration. First, please consider supplementing the current state-focused approach with additional resources on national coordinated outreach. A state-by-state -state approach may be effective in some health issues, but in a pandemic, we need coordination. And then finally, please direct federal outreach to pay attention to white evangelicals. This community requires a specific type of outreach, and failure to do so puts all communities at risk. Should we have anticipated the white evangelical resistance? Absolutely. Uh, the reason we started this campaign at the, as early as end of December, even before vaccines were released, was because I think the masking controversy told us where this was headed, that the uh, a, a common sense public health effort got politicized, got polarized, um, got used by folks uh, trying to gain uh, attention and hearing to divide our country and our evangelical community. And we saw that the same thing was likely going to happen with the vaccine. And so I would say that uh, overall, from where I sit, uh, the public health efforts have been amazing in terms of the logistics and the development of the vaccine. It has been slow and, and a little bit late in messaging. And that's where I would encourage for the rest of this campaign and for future public health efforts to prioritize messaging as, a, as important uh, of an investment to make as you do in the research and development of the actual vaccine itself, because a vaccine sitting on a shelf is not doing any good to anyone. Mr. Chang, I'll ask you just to comment on that as well, just from the outside of governments, obviously, that it, and, and there is, a, I think, a significant amount of evidence that it's not politics that are that as, as a major reason why many people are choosing not to be vaccinated. It is more in that framework of their own autonomy and, and who they do trust. You want to if you maybe address that in terms of pre preparing for the next pandemic? I think one of the things that the federal government should think about in putting in its toolkit to prepare for the next pandemic is to develop a roster of trusted faith leaders that they can convene very quickly and early on to bring them together to have a unified message. If you look at what happened with white evangelicals, what happened was individual leaders had to take the decision at different times to speak out on this, and then they got slammed by the, the opposition. So Franklin Graham did that, got killed on social media. He withdrew and went quiet for a while. J.D. Greer, the former president of the Southern Baptist Convention, then stepped up, he got slammed on social media. So this was one by one, they were coming forward, and all of you know what that's like to be the, the lone target uh, out there. And so if the federal government had, had enough foresight to actually do the convening work of bringing leaders together, because unfortunately the evangelical church does not convene itself very easily. It's a very, by design, a, a, uh, a sort of decentralized movement. So it requires an outside body like the federal government to convene these folks together, let them present a united front. They were there, they just couldn't bring themselves together to form a united voice. They needed the government to help them. Mr. Chang, I, I found your testimony fascinating. I, I read the written version of it because I was not here during your opening. I was at an armed services committee hearing and you point out that you know a path to greater vaccination is through the uh, white evangelical church. You have two kind of recommendations, one of which just seems unassailable, find trusted leaders, evangelical leaders, and gather them together so that when there are messages about vaccination, people are hearing them from the folks that they most trust. And I think you've all sort of testified to this. You got to meet people where they are rather than expect people to come to where you are. So whether that's outreach in minority communities, evangelical communities, that sounds like a really good strategy. But the, the other sort of half of what you said is that sort of a, a, a mistrust or uh, uh, among evangelicals for sort of governmental authority. And, and over the course of my public life, that's puzzled me. I, I had a pivotal experience of living in a military dictatorship in Honduras when I was, you know, young, 1983, 1984. So I guess I saw what a really bad government can do. And it gave me a perspective that, the, you know, our government here, our small D democracy certainly isn't perfect, but I can, I see how it is elsewhere. So while I never hesitated to criticize authority, I have a 
sort of deep appreciation for how lucky we have it compared to elsewhere. What are strategies that we ought to be embracing to try to bring down that mistrust? In addition to using trusted messengers, what are things that we as officials could do to start to tear down slowly that mistrust? That's a great question. And I think one of the things that I've been trying to do is to actually teach my uh, fellow Christians that institutions are people too, that institutions are comprised of people, that they're human. These are human institutions, and therefore they are going to be flawed. And I think part of the problem is for, for evangelical Christians is we're, we're in some ways hyper-individualistic. It's probably built into our faith. It's sort of me and God. Mm -hmm. Personal relationship. Personal relationship. And the idea that actually also human beings also comprise institutions is something that isn't very strongly taught in the evangelical community. But it's critical because if we don't think of institutions as human, then when they do change their mind, we think these institutions are just cannot be trusted. Whereas we're okay with individuals changing their mind, we somehow are not okay with institutions changing their mind. And a lot of when we say, well, you know, I'm hearing so many different things from the CDC, it's because the CDC is made up of scientists who are human beings, who are re responding to new information and new data and are changing their mind and may not get it right in the first time. So I think uh, certainly within the evangelical community to humanize institutions is critical. And then from the vantage point of public institutions, the more you can present a human face behind the institutions, the more that I think that sense of, of humanity uh, can come through.